We're going to run it again, you guys. Good morning, everybody. My name is Philip Bain. I'm the Managing Director of Smart Cities Council. This morning with us, we have Dr. Janie Camp from Vanderbilt, Michael Blair from the Northeast Seward, Ohio Sewer District in Cleveland. We have Terry Yates and Billy Lee from the city of Cary, North Carolina. This is all part of our session on um, uh, mitigating the impact of urban flooding on vulnerable populations. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay, cool. So I just want to go over for everybody who is participating where we are right now. Um, this is part of our ongoing readiness challenge, which is a quarterly challenge that we hold every calendar quarter. Um, we select cities that have vital projects that need to get accelerated both for their benefit but for the benefit of other cities. Our whole goal here is to accelerate project implementation. Um, each calendar quarter, we're going to have two to three cities that go through this process that you're seeing today. And again, the goal is to, uh, is to accelerate their projects. Um, on, in attendance, we have, uh, I think today, about 30 other cities. On average, we've had between 25 and 30 other cities, all of who um, will get the advantage of securing the same roadmap that, um, that Nashville has. Just for those of you that may be interested, um, please go to our website. Uh, you'll see that this handout is down at the bottom in handouts, and you can uh, go click and vote on a city or a project that you think uh, we should do a collaborative engagement on, similar to Nashville. Um, as you see, we've got cities from Moscow to Brisbane to Me cities in Mexico City to Morrisville, North Carolina, Colorado Springs, Omaha, Orange County, Palmdale, and of course, Nashville. So please go and vote. That'll be part of what we consider in terms of which cities that we select. Um, now, just so you understand what all cities are getting, we actually have an online collaborative planning tool called uh, Smart Cities Activator. And in it, we're putting in all of the key components of the roadmap for mitigating the impact of urban flooding. Um, this, we're doing this as part of our engagement with Nashville and part of what you're participating in today. Um, we will do everything from identify needs to stakeholders to data to strategies. We will include sensor solutions and data modeling solutions. And any city in the world that is interested can get a free copy of this roadmap to start their own plan. Um, just so you understand the schedule and where we are, this is the fourth of, of a total of about six or seven sessions. Um, in this session, we particularly have cities like Cleveland and, and Cary um, describing what they've done and how they've done it. Next week, we'll have a deep dive into sensor solutions. The following week, we'll talk about data modeling. We've added a new session in January, which is about how do you collect data and analytics about communities themselves, so not just about water management, but also the community. And then in the month of February, we finalize the Activator Roadmap and deliver it to Nashville as part of our engagement. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Janie Camp, who is our moderator today. Take it on, Janie. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. And again, it's an honor to be here. We've got a great lineup of speakers, and I'm happy to be helping represent Nashville as we go through this process. It's a great city. And uh, like all cities, we're looking to the future and trying to improve things here for our residents. Um, so our first presenter this morning is going to be Michael Blair. As Philip said, he's with the Northeast Ohio Sewer District. He's a project manager there. Prior to that, he worked for Tetra Tech um, and has a background in geology, which I found interesting when I was um, trying to learn more about him. But we'll um, go ahead and let him get started so we have plenty of time for questions. Um, our last session of this, we ended up having some great conversation at the end, so I'm going to make sure we have time for that. So I'll hand it off to you, Michael. I see your slides, so take it away. Okay, that's all. Thanks, thanks a lot, Jane, and, and thanks for confirming that you can see my slides. So, um, everyone, thank you very much for allowing me to participate uh, in, the, in the webinar today. And what I'd like to do is talk a little bit. Whoops, lost my slides here. Let's see what's going on. Uh, can you still see my slides? So, Michael, we see your slides in presenter view. Um, so, we see the next slide also. 
um, you may have to choose a different window to or screen to show so that we see just the slide you want us to see. Yeah, let me see if I can change this over. Let me see if I can, maybe what I'll do is uh, get on this. Okay, let me try and do the uh, the PDF instead. It might be better. Um, that can work either way, fun. Okay, so if you, um, can you see the, uh, the screen now with just one slide? The first slide looks good. Thank you. Okay, very good. All right, thanks everybody, I appreciate it. Uh, so again, thank you very much for allowing me to participate in today's uh, webinar. And, and what I will like to discuss with you a little bit about how the uh, Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District is, is basically using a, very, a variety of different monitoring equipment um, to, that allows us to basically manage our regional stormwater uh, system uh, watersheds. Uh, we've also used some of this equipment as well on our wastewater side. But uh, for today's uh, discussion, I was going to mainly discuss about our, our stormwater, um, how we use this in our stormwater system. But to get an idea, um, just a little bit of background, the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District um, is basically a political subdivision within the city of, or excuse me, the state of Ohio. And we were created um, um, basically by a court order back in 1972. And so we are considered a regional agency uh, within the state of Ohio that is separate and distinct from uh, the municipalities and the counties that we serve. Um, in our service area, which you can see here um, delineated and, and uh, bordered in red, is that we basically have uh, four major uh, watersheds within our area. We have the Cuyahoga River, which uh, was infamous for uh, back in 1969 for catching on fire. It's a lot better now than it was uh, back then. We've also got the Rocky River, the Chagrin River, and then some smaller direct tributaries that feed direct, directly into Lake Erie. And all these, um, and what we do um, for the sewer district is that we monitor what we call the regional system. And the regional system is the portion of, the, of these waterways that has a drainage area of 300 acres or more. And we are responsible for the conveyance of that water from that point all the way to Lake Erie. Anything that has a watershed smaller than 300 acres or a drainage area smaller than 300 acres, uh, that's considered the local system. And that, that is run either by the municipality or the private uh, property owners. And then we, but a lot of times we'll coordinate with them on various projects. So of this whole area, we basically, um, our regional system consists of about 476 miles of watercourses, floodplains, lakes, uh, culverted streams and crossings uh, within our 373 square mile acre stormwater service area. We basically cover uh, essentially most of Cuyahoga County, which is where the city of Cleveland is located. And then we also have portions of some of the surrounding uh, counties, uh, about four of those counties all together. Um, now, a couple of the big challenges that we have, and I imagine um, a lot of the people who are on here as well uh, deal with, with your stormwater issues, um, is a combination of, of the increasing impervious surfaces and aging con uh, conveyance infrastructure. Within our stormwater service area, about one third of that of, of our service area is covered by impervious surface, whether that this is uh, highways, roads, trails, buildings, parking lots. That's basically what's uh, uh, preventing water from percolating through the, uh, through the soils to the groundwater system and then slowly being released uh, to the waterways here. Instead, what we're doing is we're getting a lot more of these, uh, this water um, immediately getting into the waterways, increasing the peak flows in our water courses, and then we have a much more greater volume running through these over the course of, the, of a storm event than you would normally have with much less uh, uh, amount of impervious surface area. The second big challenge is that we have is, um, especially for example, with the city of Cleveland, is that we have a lot of aging infrastructure. Um, a lot of, especially in Cuyahoga County where the city of Cleveland was located, um, a lot of this uh, infrastructure was put in around the turn of the last century. Um, and especially with some of the big uh, culverted stream sections and such, these were put in in the 30s and they're re really reaching the end of their life 
uh, cycle. And at this point, we're starting to get into that and starting to look at how we're going to, how these are creating problem areas within our regional stormwater system and how we can go about um, developing alternatives to address those. So in 2016, uh, the regional stormwater, or excuse me, the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District uh, put into action our regional stormwater management program. And this basically sets on uh, sets the top four pillars. The first one that I'm mainly involved with is uh, planning. Um, and with that, what we're doing is that we're looking at each of the major watersheds within our service area and developing stormwater master plans to basically check what the health is of each of these sub watersheds, gather um, data on the stream, on the floodplains, on the buildings and other uh, assets that are within there that are impacted by, by storms and flood events. And then we're also developing swim models of these entire watersheds and taking all this information and instead of looking for problem areas, just within individual communities, we're now starting to look at this as a regional system and addressing these as regional problems that need to be addressed uh, with alternatives uh, that would address it in a regional manner as well. We've completed three of the four master plans at this point, and we're going to be looking at finishing the last one, which involves the Lake Erie Direct Tributaries and the Chagrin River, uh, probably be about the third quarter of this year. Once we, um, in addition to that, we have our um, stormwater inspection and maintenance team. And a lot of what they're doing is that they're doing a lot of preventative maintenance and assessing the health of, uh, of the streams and water courses uh, in our service area, and basically doing a lot of preventative maintenance uh, prior to a storm event. Once a storm event actually does occur, they'll also go out and do post-storm uh, post cleanup so that we can restore the, uh, the conveyance of of the uh, waters through our regional stormwater system. Now, as I mentioned, we're finishing up these stormwater master plans. And as of today, uh, we've, with the completion of three of those, we have about $750 million worth of projects. And I would say we have probably about, uh, probably about 500 projects overall that, we're, that we've identified in those, in those three watersheds so far. Um, now, some of those will be done by us, but th some of those will also be done by individual communities and other stakeholders. And what we're going to be doing is basically we prioritize those and uh, nominate those projects, and we use those um, to develop our construction schedule for the next five years. And we'll hand that over to our construction uh, group. We'll do a lot of the pre-design and construction of those individual projects. And then the fourth pillar of that is um, of our management program is working with individual stakeholders and communities to develop overall good practices um, for trying to manage the stormwater system overall. So we can try and decrease these, these flash floods that we, we could potentially have and the erosive character that they result in, um, both to uh, uh, prevent flooding from occurring and erosion, but also to improve the overall water quality of the watersheds um, in our stormwater service area. Now, the big way that we're we're paying for this uh, this management program is that the regional stormwater, or excuse me, the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District has actually set up a stormwater fee system where we actually uh, charge a fee uh, to our ratepayers um, for the impervious surface uh, that covers their individual properties, and we do this by by charging five hundred, excuse me, five dollars and fifteen dollars per uh, what we call an equivalent uh, residential unit or ERE. And so what we'll do is we'll take a look at that imper uh, the amount of impervious service and we'll charge that rate um, based on the, the number of ERUs. And we've actually set this up for residential properties in a three tier system. So for tier one, anyone that has 2000 square feet of, of impervious area, uh, we'll charge $3.09 and nine cents a month or nine dollars and twenty seven cents a quarter um, for their for their rates um, at the upper end for tier three for residential areas anyone who has four thousand square feet or more um, they're going to be charged about twenty seven dollars and eighty one cents per quarter uh, for their impervious area and then we have a separate fee for our non-residential properties that'd be the commercial industrial uh, properties within our service area we do have a we do have a carrot um, aspect of the, of these stormwater fees, 
And then we do work with various stakeholders and residents and such to try and get them to use uh, various stormwater control measures, such as green roofs, rain gardens, rain barrels, uh, to try and mitigate uh, uh, some of the stormwater that's going to be coming off these impervious areas and getting into the local and eventually in the regional stormwater system. And, by, and what they can actually do is get uh, up to about 25% off uh, their, their fees uh, by incorporating some of these uh, stormwater control measures. So what I'd like to do next is talk a little bit about the, um, the various monitoring systems that we use um, in our service area uh, for monitoring the various watersheds. So um, as we look here, we've got uh, our rain gauge network. We have the system of trail, camera trail monitors that I'll be talking about a little bit. And then the big one that we use quite a bit is our flow and water level monitoring meters. So first off, what I'd like to do is talk about our rain gauge network. Um, overall, in our, in our overall service area and extending a little bit beyond that, is that the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District maintains a um, rain gauge network of about 45 um, stationary rain gauges. And these rain gauges are set up that uh, they'll collect the information and then we use a uh, telog system. They'll actually send that data to our central uh, district office where we can download that information and, and get all this information real time so that we can make decisions on where we want to send our cleanup crews after a storm event uh, to respond to areas where we might have had, uh, for example, a lot of debris catching up on a, on a debris and trash rack that's a, at the mouth of a, a culverted stream, or where we've seen a large amount of rain occurring um, that we know we need to go to that community and do some post uh, cleanup that might have, have dealt with flooding issues. So we, we, we use this, uh, this RAIN network for that. And then we also will use this, uh, we'll take this data and we actually have a contract with an outside consultant that will take our RAIN gauge uh, data and then also radar, rain, uh, our radar information uh, from the uh, National Weather Service. And they'll combine that information. And what they'll do is they'll give us a monthly uh, uh, gauge adjusted radar rainfall uh, summary of the storm events that occurred within that particular month. And we found that this information has been really useful for both uh, taking that information and developing and, main and maintaining our uh, swim models that we're developing for each of the subwatersheds. And then we're also taking this information as well. And we are under a consent decree with the, um, uh, with the EPA uh, to mitigate the amount of wastewater that's getting into Lake Erie. So we're using this information on our consent decree uh, projects, uh, especially in our combined sewer areas, um, primarily which are located in the city of Cleveland and some of the uh, uh, first ring suburbs and using that to um, do our pre-design um, and final design of our consent decree projects uh, that we need to do in the area. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll, use, we'll use this rain gauge information and this will help us direct where we want to send our crews uh, to the various communities within our service area to do post-storm cleanup. So for example, on the image that you're seeing here, we had a storm on July 5th, where we actually had 51 sites that were field visited. And based on the, on the rain information that we received, we were able to identify 22 sites that were, that were flooded. And that's primarily where we would send our crews uh, to do post-storm water or post-storm analysis and uh, determine whether or not there's any post-storm uh, cleanup that is necessary. The next monitoring system that we've, we've been using the last several years is a system of trail cameras. Um, and we've been, been using this for both um, our maintenance uh, side, but also for compliance monitoring. And to give you an exa example of this, um, if you look in the upper, upper right uh, uh, of the slide, you'll see one of our consent decree uh, green infrastructure sites. And this is located in our Slavic village area of, of the city of Cleveland. Uh, we've built this uh, infrastructure site to offload some of the stormwater from the combined sewer system area of this, uh, this neighborhood in Cleveland. And in order to make sure that the uh, system is activating properly and such, we've actually installed trail cameras on there to monitor the inlet um, of the stormwater coming into this uh, infrastructure site 
and uh, basically monitoring to make sure that it's, it's, it's working optimally um, as it was originally designed. And again, we've had these trail cameras set up that we can actually have uh, the photos and the videos telemetry back to our central office so we can monitor this in real time. Uh, the second type of, of, of use of this trail camera um, has been in, in monitoring our uh, several of our class one dams that are located in the stormwater service area. Uh, in the image below, uh, this is an upstream view of a class one dam that we have um, in one of our communities. Uh, the dam itself is an earthen dam that was built in 1964. And uh, it's located in a community that's uh, suffering a lot of economic stress at this point. And they were having a hard time uh, basically keeping this class one dam in compliance. And um, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, which is in charge of these dams, um, did has done inspections. They found out that the dam was in not in compliance. And since this was on the regional system and that the individual community itself was having a hard time keeping the, uh, the dam in compliance, we offered to provide assistance where we would actually monitor the compliance of this dam um, in the interim stage until uh, we fully developed the stormwater master plan and come up with an alternative to uh, determine whether or not this dam is actually needed um, could it be modified to uh, maybe a class three dam or can we remove it altogether? So what we're doing is we're actually using this trail cam to monitor uh, whether or not we actually get water uh, building up behind the dam or not. Uh, this is a unique dam in that it actually sits on top of a culverted stream but where you see that black little circle there, there's a, a window there that if uh, the culvert becomes uh, overwhelmed, the water will surcharge through that and back up into the dam. So we're basically monitoring to see if we have any water uh, mounting up behind the dam or not. And so far what we've seen is that uh, we're not having that uh, take place. And if we could confirm that with our swim models, we might be able to remove this dam altogether, which would be great if we can remove a class one dam from our service area. The other thing that we've been doing um, is we've actually been using trail cameras uh, to mon monitor areas where we've seen a lot of, of erosion taking place. Uh, for example, in this area, we've noticed a lot of erosion taking place on the uh, associated with the east abutment of the Lancaster Bridge. And initially, what the thought was is that um, the stream that was going underneath it was basically undercutting the soils here and that we're getting um, a lot of erosion as a result of the stream. And unfortunately, since I'm using the PDF here, I can't actually show you the video, but um, what we were able to do in 2020 is actually put a couple of trail cameras here, and we actually monitored how that erosion was taking place during various storm, storm events. And what we actually determined was that the stream really doesn't get all that high during storm events. What's really causing the issue with, um, uh, with erosion around this abutment is that we're getting a lot of, of, of sheet flow coming off uh, around that east embankment, uh, getting into the soils and actually causing sloughing, which has now impacted that, that abutment. So knowing how the what the mechanics are of the erosion, we've been able to actually start a pre-design of a project that will actually um, mitigate the erosion uh, around that abutment and maintain the, the structural integrity of the bridge itself. So finally, what we're, one of the big instruments that we've been using for, for monitoring um, within our, our regional stormwater management uh, area um, are these flow and high water uh, meters. Um, we've been using both commercial portable flow and water level monitors within our service area, both again for our wastewater and for stormwater. And then primarily for stormwater, we've also been um, working with the USGS in establishing uh, a number of stream monitoring stations um, at key points within our watershed uh, to be able to monitor the amount of flow and water levels uh, within our regional uh, stormwater area. And we've been using these, these monitors for in a couple of ways. Um, one is that we've been using it for doing culverted monitoring and also the impact of when these culverts become surcharged and start flooding onto the surface and impacting uh, various buildings and transportation assets. And for example, back in uh, March of this year, 
we had a very large storm event uh, that had an impact on University Circle on the east side of Cleveland. Um, if you've ever been to Cleveland, University Circle is actually where uh, the Cleveland Orchestra uh, uh, has their facilities and the various art and the other uh, museums are located in this area. So a lot of our cultural assets are located in this immediate area that has to deal with this flooding. And what we've determined so far with the stormwater master plan is that overall, we've got about a five year level of service in this area. And what the problem is, is that we've got a mixture of different sized culverts going through the university circle that's, that's restricting some of the flow. And we've also been dealing with a lot of debris, uh, large debris um, in the middle of the culverts um, that we need to get cleaned out. And that's what's been causing some of the flooding. So as we're finalizing an alternative to deal with the underside portions of this culvert, um, what we've actually done is we've installed a flow meter in one of the uh, manholes uh, near where we have the lowest spot um, surface wise in relation to the culvert. And we've actually used this monitor to set up a warning level and an alarm level uh, so that we can monitor the water height in this culvert. And as we get up to close to the 90% uh, capacity in the culvert, we can actually send these warning and, and actual fl uh, potential flooding alarms, not only to uh, our district staff, but we can send this to various stakeholders as, as well, such as Case Western Reserve University, uh, the various museums, uh, the, the local police there, uh, so that if we look like we're gonna have a, a storm event, we can warn the folks to either close flood doors, um, we can have cars move from certain parking lots. And in one case, we have an apartment building here which has basement uh, apartments. If necessary, we can evacuate those basement apartment uh, dwellers uh, before they're impacted by the flooding. Uh, so this is basically an interim uh, measure that we've uh, successfully used um, as we're developing that, that final alternative for this area. Um, and then also, again, we're, we're using this, uh, these monitor, these flow meters and uh, water level meters uh, to help us with maintenance monitoring as well. So the image that you're seeing here is actually flooding that occurred uh, back on Labor Day, um, going through a portion of the uh, Cleveland Metro Park Zoo. Um, luckily, the, uh, all the animals were up in this area, so they weren't impacted by, that, by this storm event. But again, what we're doing is that we're using uh, both the USGS gauges and our portable uh, commercial meters um, to basically monitor these various subwatersheds so that when we see these high, high uh, water flows, we can identify areas where we need to uh, send our uh, cleanup crews or ins and our inspection crews uh, to respond to these storm events. And then also what we've been using is gathering all this data and we've actually now been able to develop um, or identify sites where we can do pre-storm event cleanups so that we can minimize the impact of when these storm events occur. So we're trying to do more of the preventative maintenance so we can actually minimize the post-storm events. Now, we, as I mentioned, you know, we've used these commercial, uh, uh, these commercial flow and high water level meters and the USGS meters. And what we'd like to do is, is eventually trying to develop um, uh, basically a monitoring system similar to our rain gauge system where we can get a more complete uh, view of our service area and something with a more higher resolution. And recently we were contacted by one of our stakeholders, um, the Chagrin River Watershed Partnership Group, who was contacted by a, um, a company up in uh, Michigan called HiFi. And HiFi has developed a low cost, um, easy to um, uh, install and use um, flow or excuse me, a water level meter um, that can be used in a cloud system uh, to prov provide basically um, an overall uh, coverage of, of various watersheds. And um, we were asked by uh, the, the water partnership group at HiFi if we would like to participate in a pilot program that HiFi was doing in Northeast Ohio uh, to try and, and basically test out these meters uh, to see um, how they would work in, in real world conditions. And what we've been doing uh, so far is working with um, the Spring River Watershed Partnership Group, 
uh, the Cleveland Metro Parks, um, a couple of other communities within our service area. And we've actually identified 53 air, um, sites uh, within our service area and just outside of our service area where we would like to have these uh, hi-fi meters installed. And you, if you look in the uh, picture to the right and the lower right, uh, you can get an idea of, of what these meters look like. They're basically about uh, about three to uh, four um, inches in diameter. They're about a foot long, and um, they can easily be uh, installed on a bridge abutment, uh, uh, at the inlet of a culvert, um, or on poles or other structures. And basically, they're using ultrasound to uh, um, read the water level from the meter to the to the top of the uh, of the water surface. And uh, at this point, um, they are in the process now of, of installing these these 53 meters. Um, they are um, we're hoping to have this done by the first quarter, uh, or excuse me, of January of, of next year. And what's great about these meters is that um, they're really easy to install. Uh, they're working off. They actually have a solar panel on the top of there that uh, provides uh, electricity to the, the meters themselves. Um, and then all the data is actually telemetry uh, to a cloud network that HiFi has developed, um, and then we can actually draw from that from that cloud to get the data and incorporate it with all of our other meters uh, to provide us a, a network view of 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 the water of the water surfaces within our service area. So right now we're um, we're starting the pilot study. HiFi is doing the installation. Uh, they'll also be responsible for the maintenance. Of the units uh, during the two-year period, and um, and then also providing the cloud services, and the sewer district, along with our other stakeholders, um, will actually do an assessment of the system after that two-year uh, uh, pilot program period, and give feedback to uh, HiFi uh, so that they can incorporate that uh, to see if they need to do any further design work of this uh, of these meters or of their overall system. And I think really the sewer district again is really interested in um, hopefully seeing this successfully work because this would really provide us a better idea of, of gaining a better resolution um, in our service area that would help us uh, basically do a lot of management of, of our watershed system and also again for providing um, interim uh, warnings to stakeholders while we develop our overall stormwater master plan alternatives. And with that, um, that's my presentation. I'll turn it back to uh, to Phil and Jan. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them for you. All right. Thanks, Michael. There's a wealth of information there. Um, I really appreciate what you've shared. I know Roger has a question for you. So we'll take that and maybe a, one or two others and then um, shift over to the other presentation. Sure, okay, great. Uh, it sounds like a great comprehensive program, Michael. We appreciate you uh, giving us uh, this this presentation. Um, You're welcome. My first question was on your rain your rain gauge information. Um, yes. And whether um, you know whether these are all uh, gauges that are owned and and maintained by the NEORSD personnel, are they on property owned by by the sewer district? Um, um, that's a great question, um, Roger. And, um, what I would say is that of the 45 of the 45 rain gauges um, uh, that we have in our, our rain gauge network, we actually own 29 of those. And what we've done is that we've we've located those meters um, either on some district properties where we have pump stations um, or where some of our wastewater treatment facilities. We have three water wastewater treatment facilities, so we'll locate one at each one of those. Uh, but then we also worked with our community members, um, and we've located them on top of of uh, fire stations, city halls, community centers. So we've we've we we have a great we've been fortunate to have a great working relationship with the communities in our service area, and we've we've um, set it up where we're, where they've allowed us to use their property uh, to, to install these gauges. Um, and actually, for example, uh, the city of Lakewood is just to the west of Cleveland. They actually own a rain gauge that, that, that is similar to ours, so we've incorporated that into our system. And we've actually have, in addition to the 29 that we actually own, there's another um, 
15 or excuse me, 16 uh, gauges either owned by communities or uh, Summit County um, that have been willing to allow us uh, to gather their data so we can get a more complete picture. Um, and what we've done is while we when we get all this information, we also, I also provide this back to those communities. So if they're using, using that information for, for particular design work and construction, they have that available to them. Um, so I hope that answered your question. Okay, it, yeah, certainly. And, and then the other uh, part of that question is, is do you use any of the data from these gauges uh, in your in in making emergency response decisions, like during an emergency activation, so where you're kind of tracking where the intensive rain is around your system, the kind of target areas that might need uh, even even things like like water rescues and those kinds of things. Uh, yes, so that's a that's a great question. So we we so far what we've been using these uh, these these gauges for is that um, as we do we get the data in real time. Um, our, our stormwater inspection and maintenance group um, is monitoring these the rain going on. And where we see actually um, areas that are getting pounded by, by um, rainfall, we can actually send inspectors out there to, to basically um, see, you know, go to that site if there isn't already a, um, a, a trail camera there, go out on site and see what the effects are of, of the rain going on and coordinate with that community to see whether or not uh, we need to, for example, let's say uh, close off gates to prevent cars from going along a particular transportation uh, corridor, or mm -hmm. we uh, work with them to say, hey, um, uh, you may need to close this business or or get customers out of that building because of impend impending flooding that's going to impact on that on that building. So we have we have really started using that uh, for that purpose. Um, traditionally, what we've been doing is sending the inspector out. They're monitoring the the uh, rain event um, in time, and then they're getting on um, on the phone with our contractors to be ready that once that storm event uh, stops and the water starts to subside, that we can get in there and start immediate cleanup. So that if need be, we can restore the transportation corridor, clean up a debris rack, that sort of thing. Good. Appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Roger. Thank Thanks, Michael. Um, I'm, I didn't see Jennifer Higgs, who's um, with our IT um, and planning group here, but I know she would be interested in the data. Um, something I'm interested in is for the um, trail cameras, is that data real time? Is it being archived? How are you uh, managing and processing that data? Are you using computer vision or anything like that to process some of that to help in making decisions? So, that, so that's a good question. We, we, actually, we actually get the, uh, uh, the, the photographs and, and mainly the video um, is telemetry uh, back to our, our central station uh, real time. And for certain, for certain trail cameras, for example, with that one that, uh, that uh, class one dam um, that's located um, on the east side of Cleveland, we actually have during the storm events, we're actually doing real time monitoring of that to see um, if we're getting any water behind that. And again, using that, um, we we might actually have that station in an area where if we start uh, seeing the water coming up that might threaten the business, that we can go ahead and warn that business is that uh, they may need to move cars and possibly put up uh, floodgates and such. Um, so we're using that in real time for that. And then we're also using that data over time and, and over several days, and unfortunately, I wasn't able to show you that video of that uh, Lancaster Bridge abutment, but we're using that and, um, and basically slicing all that data together so we can do long-term monitoring to get a better idea of, of how, how erosion is taking place around some of our various assets and such. So we've, we, we've been using it for both instances. Okay, that's good to know. And um, I was also I know, um, thanks. I know Tom has a question, so I'll let him ask that um, in just a second. But can you speak to the cost of the commercial flood monitors? I know Nashville is looking at, you know, if, if we go with low cost sensors and things like that, can you give us a ballpark of what one of those might cost? Uh, so for the hi-fi units, um, we, we've, we've been in discussion with them and they're, they're right now they're developing they're developing what their cost is, and they really haven't given us an idea of what the what 
what the per unit cost of that is. I'm hoping that they're going to be uh, about around hundred dollars, maybe a couple hundred dollars. Uh, the Telog systems and such that we're using, uh, if I remember right, to be honest with you, I'd have to I'd have to take a look at those again and and what I could do is, okay. if you like follow up with you with those costs. Mark that. All right, that would be great. Um, Tom, do you want to ask your question because it also gets to kind of the funding situation? Sure, sure. Thank you, Michael. So we have a Thank similar you. user fee like you guys do, where we have three tiers for residential and then uh, different tiers for for um, non-residential. And and we would, I'd really like to go to the ERU. We like the ERU better, but we're not there yet. But what's your annual revenue off your user fee, and then what kind of capital improvements program does that support each year? Um, if I remember right, um, and I'd have to confirm this, is that um, we annually bring in, uh, I believe it's around $40 million. I'd have to confirm that. And then basically that's that's paying for all of our, um, it's paying for both our planning, our inspection, uh, inspection work. It's basically paying for the whole management program. I would say of that, I, I believe our capital projects, we have about a 25 million dollar budget each year for for cap for doing the various capital improvements and uh and projects that we're trying to do along the stormwater service area so as i as i mentioned you know um we're expecting that when we complete all four of our stormwater master plans we're probably going to have a billion dollars worth of work that's going to be needed to be done just along the, the regional stormwater system and you know with a with a capital budget of, you know about 25 million um, you know, each year, it's going to take a long time to do all those. So we're really looking for, you know, for different funding sources and different partners. So some of these projects we're going to be doing in hand. Um, we're also going to be working with our community members to help pay for some of this. And I should say, um, you know, with the with the amount of with the amount of money that we bring in each year with these stormwater rates, um, we actually when we develop the management program. Some of the communities in our in our stormwater service area uh, didn't want to give up these rates. They wanted to keep it local, and and basically they took us to court with that. And as part of the final set, settlement is that um, while we while we uh, uh, collect all these rates, 25% um, of the rates that we collect um, basically go back to the local communities um, for various projects that they want to use. So we call that community cost share money. So we manage that money, but what the communities can do is that they can actually uh, propose various projects, and they build up they build up credit each year, and um, they can use let's say for example let's say the city of Brook Park uh, they might get uh, let's say um, they might generate let's say ten thousand dollars each year of community cost share. So that particular year they could come up with a ten thousand dollar project um, that they want to do. Uh, uh, and use that money up, or they can actually um, save that money over a five-year period if they want to try and do a bigger project that they normally couldn't pay for with just one year's community cost share. So we 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 can so as that, in that case, what we can do is we can work with our partners in using some both of our funds, their community cost share, and then some other outside um, sources, for example, Army Corps and others, uh, to pay for some of these projects. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Great. Great question, Tom. And thanks for that um, example and application um, of that. How you all are managing those funds, Michael. Um, I think I'm hoping we'll have some time for more questions at the end um, after the next presentation. So, uh, but you've definitely got me and hopefully others from the Nashville team and others here thinking it's amazing to see how that regional perspective of how you all are managing this and um, being proactive and utilizing data and sensors to move forward. Um, well, so thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. All right. Um, we're going to shift over to um, Terry Yates and Billy Lee with the town of Cary, North Carolina, a little bit closer to Nashville. Um, and um, Terry is a PMO in the smart city program manager for Cary and Billy is the stormwater operations manager um, for the city. So I think we'll turn it over and let you all start in the interest of time and um, 
I think we'll have some good discussion following this also. Thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so can can everybody see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so um, thank thank you for the introduction. Um, I you know want to start off. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, the Smart City Council uh, as well as City of Nashville uh, for allowing uh, Billy and I to present. Um, uh, we're going to, uh, basically our presentation is talking about how, uh, it's a little smart cities, um, combined with stormwater. So we're going to talk about creating our, uh, smart connected community. And this is the stormwater edition of that. So, um, and we're going to tag team this presentation. Uh, I'm going to cover, um, the first, uh, first couple points, uh, we, we just want everybody uh, really for our presentation to get uh, three key takeaways. Um, we're going to talk about our one carry vision um, and then uh, move into our adaptive approach to stormwater. And then we'll talk about how we pull it all together uh, uh, as part of our smart and connected community ecosystem. So, um, so with our one carry effort, uh, we're really trying to, um, with all with stormwater and everything we're doing around smart cities and smart communities, is we're trying to build this uh, uh, 360 degree view of not only the town but kind of the region. Um, and and what that means is, on the operation side of things, we have a 360 degree view of the town. Uh, and we use our core platforms. Uh, we use uh, Esri, Salesforce, uh, SaaS for analytics um, to really create a model to show uh, everything about not only uh, our stormwater environment, but also our citizens, uh, work orders, uh, what's going on in the town. Uh, almost like a single source of truth. Um, and then with those with those platforms, we also want to create that 360 degree view of the citizen. And what that means is, is that a citizen should come into the town um, and be able to uh, be able to do everything from one place, uh, register for a parks event, uh, get stormwater alerts, um, um, be able to submit a permit to do and put a deck on their house and all of that. Um, and where all of those things come together. Uh, is 311 and 911. Um, and, and you know, we always, when we're talking to cities, you know, even if you don't have a 31 system, uh, or let's say you're not a primary PSAP, um, you always have this non emergency and emergency contact location. And, and that's where these things intersect together. Um, you know, I always like to say that, uh, Carrie, we want to know everything about the city, uh, everything that's going on whether it's flooding, whether it's, uh, you know, a storm coming in, whether it's, um, you know, a vent, we all want to, uh, we should know all the status of that before the citizen calls us. So, uh, you know, that's what we're trying to achieve. Uh, so that's kind of our one carry approach. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Billy to talk about our adaptive uh, stormwater. Thank you, Terry. Can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, I, I, the new system for me. Uh, just to put things in perspective, uh, and and um, you know from the previous presentation, the town carries about 170,000 people. Um, we've got about 1,200 employees that uh, um, that service the, uh, those 170,000. We're about 65 square miles of drainage area, uh, and the town of Cary is at the top of the basin. Uh, as a matter of fact, downtown ha is the very, very top for three, four different uh, major drainage basins. So um, we we have a our stormwater is, um, is is based on you know high intensity rainfall events uh, and creating issues. But again, you know small streams with quick response times are needed. Also, we don't have a utility. We're a phase two MPDS phase two community. Uh, we do not have a stormwater utility. Everything that we do in terms of stormwater is is based on on the um, our capital funding. Um, within stormwater, uh, we do have a condition assessment program that is GIS based, 
And just a few years back, our um, we got a new town manager. He came in and quickly realized stormwater was one of the biggest issues in in our community. And um, with that, we uh, formed. Uh, he he put it at the top of his priority list, and uh, we went out and got stakeholders involved. You want to? Can I change this or? Uh, and 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 form a group um, of citizen stakeholders, a very targeted group. We listened to what they had to say. Then we formed groups within the town. The our our stormwater group at that time were, were eight individuals, and that's it. We've since grown to twelve uh, with one vacant position. So I mean, in terms of scale, we're 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 a lot smaller. But we, we uh, formed an organization, as shown here, had got about 45 people uh, within the town to be a part of it, and spent about a year uh, trying to figure out where we we're going to go. Okay, next slide. Uh, you know, our approach was, you know, to look at our ordinances. Again, the condition assessment, also maintenance was maintenance was important. Um, the, also, we determined that you know we have 65 square miles of drainage that we needed to, to do a pilot uh, in one of those basins. So we chose the downtown basin, Walnut Creek. Uh, it's about three square miles. It's the oldest part of the town. It's uh, in the in the part of the town that predated any uh, uh, any stormwater management. Next slide. Um, here's the Walnut Creek Basin. Again, it's about three square miles. Uh, we had a consultant do a uh, swim model for us in this basin. And, um, and, and so that we could look at our, our issues and determine what we needed to do from there. Since that time, we have probably generated a good six different projects that we've done uh, and and has really been uh, the foundation uh, for de the development and redevelopment of our community. Um, it, it has done a, a lot uh, to uh, help us in, in moving forward. And, and we approach this from the condition assessment side and um, and we're in a GIS based condition assessment side, but the the fact is, is we got hooked up with Terry and the uh, IoT smart city side of things. We were going to have to put sensors along this stream uh, in order to calibrate our models. Um, next slide. And and so. Uh, we, we came in and and said, okay, we've got a chance to to uh, kind of expand on our efforts, you know, from the capital program, and and we started looking at the smart cities. And here in North Carolina, uh, there the state has a program uh, that is a, a flood based program in which uh, we have a website called Feynman's that actually um, monitor stream gauge data real time uh, throughout the state. And our goal was to uh, take and put these stream sensors in and uh, tie to, to the state's program. Uh, again, this small basin, we put in seven, uh, seven uh, water level sensors and three rain gauges. Uh, next slide. Uh, here is a, uh, a photograph of one of uh, the sensor installs. Um, we we tied the uh, we have a, a it's a radar based uh, green stream unit uh, that that works on radar and 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 it uh, records the water level and and on the right hand side is a rain gauge that we put in on, on one of our um, parking decks. Next slide. And with that, I'll turn it back over uh, to Terry and let him talk about the smart city side of our deployment. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Billy. Um, and uh, 
you know, to further expand on the, the sensors that we used, um, we uh, engaged with a group uh, called NC Riot, uh, which is an incubator in Raleigh who uh, incubates startups and uh, companies that are, you know, getting off the ground uh, and try to provide solutions, uh, you know, from an economic development standpoint. Uh, Greenstream was a company that was primarily in the Norfolk area and they moved uh, to the Raleigh area about a year ago. Um, and so uh, they provided a, a series of low cost radar sensors that we, um, you know, that we put in in that stream basin. Um, and, you know, it's been a really great partnership um, uh, uh, as well as, you know, we've worked with, uh, Billy was mentioning uh, the state, We've been working with Raleigh. Uh, a good point to the comment about us being at the top of the river basin. All of our all of our rain flows to our regional partners, and so you know we want to. It's very important to us to, for us to share that data out to our regional partners, and you know Feynman allows us to do that. The state's uh, platform, as well as um, being able to provide that data in a standardized format. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in this uh, slide here. Um, this is the primary slide I'm going to talk about. I'm going to focus on. Um, we're kind of going to talk. I'm going to talk about it from kind of the bottom left-hand corner, and and we're going to kind of go around this circle, and uh, we'll talk about our ecosystem and what each component uh, component is. Uh, so starting at this bottom uh, area, we have our IoT devices, sensors, and networks. Um, so in Cary, it's real important for us to not uh, First of all, in, smart, in our smart cities effort, it's important for us not to be uh, a bunch of siloed platforms. Uh, we want all of these different sensors and maybe large solutions such as, uh, you know, in, our, in that bottom picture, we've got our traffic man, uh, uh, signal head, so our traffic management system. Um, uh, we have our SCADA systems, uh, and, so we have, and we have our flood uh, sensors, we have some greenway counters, uh, it's important for us to have data from these all these solutions flowing into our ecosystem, uh, so that we can in, we can unbolt a solution and bolt in a new solution at any point, any time, uh, and we're not locked into that vendor lock-in. Um, you know, another uh, important thing it, around that is you know we can have three or four different um, uh, uh, water level sensor providers. And we can tie them into this ecosystem. Um, and so that's another important element. Um, uh, you know, if we're not getting the performance from one vendor, we can shift to another vendor. So um, so those bottom pictures on the left uh, are really meant to represent the various types of sensors, the various type of platforms. Um, that data from those different devices obviously needs a communication path. And we do that with a variety of different systems. We do it with uh, we do it with our fiber. We have an extensive fiber network. Uh, so we connect sensors and platforms to that fiber network, pull that data from those from that area. Uh, wireless. Uh, we use a lot of wireless services. Uh, what's really cool uh, what's really cool about the the stormwater sensors and the rain gauges we've deployed, we're using FirstNet uh, service through at and t on those. Um, I'm not sure how many folks know what FirstNet is, but uh, you know it's the public safety broadband network. Uh, that's been recently deployed uh, nationwide <laughs> with, a, with certain levels of uh, service, guaranteed levels of service. Uh, but they also, uh, and it's primarily, people have thought of it as kind of a voice service or a data service uh, for first responders, but you can definitely use it for these types of installations because this is a first responder uh, data application in our view. Uh, and it's a great way to get uh, your feet wet with FirstNet so I just kind of wanted to talk about that. Um, so all of that data from these different platforms, these di different sensors, uh, flow into a Microsoft uh, Azure uh, data environment. Uh, and what we do, as soon as that data comes in from those sensors, those platforms, what we want to do is standardize it in the same format. So, you know, I go back to talking about you can have three different uh, solution providers for the sensors when you get that data in standardize it and standardize it in a way that it doesn't matter what provider you have you standardize it in a in a standardized format uh, and then you can start feeding it to these other other platforms that you have uh, so 
Microsoft really serves as kind of our ingestion, uh, serves as our data store, data lake, uh, but also uh, uh, sends that data to our various major platforms. Uh, the first of which uh, is Esri. We are using Esri for uh, real-time visualization and situational awareness. Um, uh, in that small screen there, uh, we have our stormwater sensors, we have our greenway counters, uh, we have uh, uh, data coming from our parking deck cameras showing our parking deck usage. Um, and we're going to expand. We're currently working to bring our traffic management system in there and our SCADA systems, uh, building automation systems into that. Uh, so it's a one stop shop. Uh, and and the, the advantage of doing that is that everyone in town has access to Esri. Uh, quite frankly, everyone in town has access to these core platforms I'm going to talk about. So security's worked out. Um, uh, you know, visualization, the training, you don't have to train folks because they can already, you know, they're already used to those platforms. So that data flows in that from a visualization standpoint. Uh, the data is also picked up simultaneously uh, by SAS. Uh, SAS is an analytics company that's based in Cary. Uh, so that data is picked up in SAS. And that's where we get that long-term analytics, um, where we can see, you know, over the last year, what types of, uh, you know, what types of flooding events have we had? How are the, the sensors impacted? Um, we are, we're getting to where we're starting to do the predictability, predictability modeling. Uh, we're bringing in AccuWeather information into this environment, uh, and we're pairing that together you know, to determine if we have this rain event, you know, what is our, uh, you know, what, what is the point where we're going to have, uh, you know, structure damage, uh, roads cresting, all of that. Uh, and we want to feed that data back into this ecosystem. Um, you know, another great point of that is battery life. When you deploy these sensors out in your stream beds, a lot of them um, uh, are you know, powered by solar and you may have battery issues. Well, we want to get to a predictability cycle where we can issue an automatic work order uh, when we have a, a battery that's getting weak and stuff like that. So uh, so we have visualization, short-term uh, analytics with Esri. We have long-term analytics, predictability model with SAS. Uh, then the data flows through a connector uh, through a company called uh, Delboomi. We have we have an existing connector through that, uh, that uh, platform that connects to Salesforce. Um, since we already had a, that connector built, we, we use that in our ecosystem. And really that, all that's doing is, is making a connection from the Microsoft Azure environment over to our Salesforce environment. What we use Salesforce for is uh, our C, it's, it's a primarily our CRM platform. Uh, we have alerts built in there so that when the water level in the stream basin hits a certain level, or actually various uh, various levels, uh, it will issue an automatic, uh, uh, what's called a chatter post, which is really an alert. Uh, any one of our uh, uh, users, operation staff who subscribes to that chatter post will get that. And it basically provides a notice saying that the water level is rising or the water level has crested a street. Uh, it provides you the link to the Esri dashboard that you can click on and you can see the real time status of the water. Um, and we're also moving into the area of, you know, being able to get the alert out to the citizen, um, which, you know, that that's we one thing we learned about our effort is we got to get the staff used to the data first uh, before we start sending this information, sending out alerts to citizens. We really need to get the staff uh, comfortable with data. And it's not just storm water data. It's all types of data, uh, you know, get folks comfortable with it and make sure it's accurate and then you can move to the next phase of possibly alerting citizens uh, when, you know, when we have issues like um, you know, any type of flooded street or whatever. So, so Salesforce is doing that. Uh, you know, kind of the bottom pictures represent, uh, and this is, uh, uh, we've got the field workers down here and the citizens. Uh, we use um, uh, uh, field force, uh, trying to think of the name of the application in Salesforce. Um, uh, there's a certain module in Salesforce that we use to alert the, the uh, field workers. They can pull the Esri dashboard up uh, uh, with their mobile device uh, or their phone. So they can see real time. They can click on the uh, sensor and then get all the information about what's going on with that sensor. 
Um, and then the final component, which is in the middle here, and I talked about it at the beginning of this slide, is our regional data sharing. Uh, we have been working as a, as a parallel effort with uh, the state of North Carolina, uh, city of Raleigh, Wake County, um, uh, the towns, uh, Morrisville, uh, uh, Holly Springs, the uh, city of Wilson. Uh, we've been working with all of those entities to create uh, the standard data sharing model. And what I, and what I mean by that is uh, the specific data sets that come from these sensors, we wanted to create a open way of pull it, being able to share that data out to those partners so that they can pull it into their ESRI or whatever, whatever environment, you know, whatever solution they want, they can pull that data in. Uh, we also want to send that to the state Feynman's uh, site, which anyone, uh, you guys could, if you just Google Feynman, uh, North Carolina Feynman system, you can go to that site and you can see all of these uh, flood sensors in the state. You can click on it. Well, we wanted to share our data from our sensors out to the state and get it in, get it as part of that. So, um, so you know, that's kind of my, the kind of the overview of our ecosystem. Uh, you know, as I mentioned before, we really want to use these core platforms for all of our smart city solutions uh, and not necessarily have to rely on the individual, uh, you know, individual siloed solutions that are typically deployed. Um, we really feel like that's the way to go. Um, it really reduces the amount of effort you have to do on the security side, the training side, um, uh, user adoptability side. Um, and, and, you know, when you think about it, all of that effort, anytime you deploy a new solution, uh, really there's that big overhead that you have to think about with those things. Uh, so with that, uh, that's pretty much uh, uh, my piece of this, and I'll end it with some questions. Stormwater was just the uh, beginning of the expansion of this whole smart city idea. Yes, that's a, hey, that's Terry, a, you, that's a great point. Terry, can you take it back to slide 11? I think we still have some questions on that, the previous slide. Yeah. That's, for me, that's sort of the money slide. Go ahead, Jenny. Sorry. Yeah. Um, thanks to both of you, Terry and Billy. So, Billy, you're saying that Stormwater was the driving force for starting to collect data and look at kind of this holistic system, um, thinking about sharing data and communicating. It was, we we were in a parallel effort with our condition assessment, you know, plus the state Feynman site um, was already up and, and, you know, Terry's efforts with, um, you know, smart cities, it just was a good fit. You know, we were both moving along in parallel and and we we had a, a brainstorm workshop uh, with, with uh, Microsoft, uh, with uh, SAS, um, you can name some others, Terry. Besides that, yep. we're just a, where we just brainstormed and we brought the two projects together, and yep. uh, and it just you know we already had we're working towards the infrastructure on both ends to make it work. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. it, it was it was really great. Um, and I will say Stormwater was the cornerstone of our Smart and Connect community ecosystem. Yeah, you know, we've been doing pilots here and there, and yeah, you know, we had these different platforms here and there that we were testing, but it really brought everything together. And once we put this in place, we have we it's very easy to just add, keep adding on to it because you've got all the pieces and parts together. <laughs> um, and 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 we did, as Billy mentioned, we did a two-day workshop. We had Microsoft, uh, Esri, SAS, Delbumi, Salesforce in for two days. We built this ecosystem and we changed it like four or five times. You know, Billy, and Billy can attest this. We changed things four or five times, but once we got it, got everything tweaked, it really, it really took off. Awesome. Um, I see that we have some of our group here in Nashville have several questions about this. So I just want to say and this Janie, is impressive. Before, I love how you connected Janie, everything. To, yes. Before sorry, we go to the Philip. questions, uh, no, that's fine. I sort of rudely interrupted, so I apologize. Um, usually I'm not asking questions, but for the audience and our team from Nashville, 
I really want to reflect on the point that Carrie just made. Carrie was one of our readiness challenge winners about three years ago. And Terry has been leading this effort in Cary, which is, you know, not a big community, but what they just discussed, this use case of taking a particular use case and using it to integrate all their other data use cases is really, really important. That is the definition. And I don't care whether you call it a green city, smart city, you know, future city, whatever you want to call it. It's about integrate. This slide for me is the money slide. If you don't have this in your community, then you can't be a smart, connected community. And so I can't tell you enough about how this effort about bringing in the experts and the vendors and then having this data integration and figuring out the use cases is, is really the future of our urban environment. So Terry and Billy, you guys deserve a lot of credit for this. And I'm going to shut up with that and go ahead and ask the questions. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Philip. Yes, I think this is, as you say, the money slide. Um, I guess that's one of the pieces I think, you know, cities like Nashville that are trying to go down this path. And I see Jennifer there um, and she's got some questions on there. We're thinking about how all this comes together, the platforms and how data. Um, and one of the questions I was going to ask is how do you clean and manage the data? So when you have it from different sensors and vendors and you touched on that, Terry, um, so I um, want to go ahead and kick it over to Jennifer. I know Linda has some questions also kind of at a higher level, but Jennifer's got like burning questions about the data and management and development of the system, I know. So um, it, it's funny because when we imp implemented Salesforce in Nashville, um, one of the cities that we looked at was um, that they showed us to was Cary. Um, so, you know, Nashville has Salesforce. We have Azure. We are building out our Azure portal, um, and we're looking at implementing you know, Geo Event Server. But we're wondering if you're using like their Geo Event Server solution, or you're using their IoT solution, because they have two different solutions out there for different things, and which one you're implementing. Yes, yeah, so uh, we actually didn't implement either. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we, um, uh, what we're doing is uh, we're bringing the data in, as I mentioned. Uh, we bring it into the Microsoft environment using their IoT hub, um, and that data uh, goes in. It's it's massaged, uh, you know, standardized. It goes into a Synapse database, um, and then it's also forwarded over to another a SQL database that uh, our GIS um, uh, uh, staff uh, take the the information from that database, and they just use the standard Esri components to visualize that those components um, mm -hmm. so that you know I, I will say and I do want to make this point I have an amazing team uh, you know and, and when I say team you know I've got a great Esri person I have a great database management person a database administrator person I have an integration development person who really handles pulling that ingesting that data and then get you know, gets it to the database person uh, a sales for you know our Salesforce admin uh, and then we have analytics folks, and so it's really important to have those core, those team members functioning coherently, and they work great together uh, because that's what it, in my opinion, that's what it. I mean, I tell them all the time. I was like, like you're building, you're a company. I mean, when you think about it, uh, you are a smart city company. You have your your pieces, your divisions, and you're building this. And so, um, so that that's you know, did that answer your question? Okay, great. Anything else, Jennifer, right now? No, I don't think so. I think that's kind of where I was at. I mean, we've looked at other solutions um, for ingesting real-time data, and I know we will be implementing geo events. Um, and we're working, we have an EA with Esri, so, you know, we're just in the right. starting of building our portal um, right. to be able to get data out we've been using gis a long time but we don't have a, yeah. that enterprise portal system yet so well and 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 i'm not saying we haven't looked at geo event server and I, I will say that um when we had this workshop with all these vendors you know they all provide similar um components and they all are trying to say let's get everything in our component we can manage that but i think the the point with this ecosystem is that 
we don't want to be in a position where everything is in one comp one component because we may want to we want to make we may want to pivot. Um, you know, I know Esri is being used by a lot of communities, and and they're great, and I'm not saying anything, but we want to be able to pivot so that you know if we decide tomorrow we don't want to use Esri, we want to use a different platform, we can unbolt bolt in a new uh, visualization platform and go there. And so, you know, I, I think that it, it's, that's just an important point. Awesome. All right, thanks Jennifer, thanks Terry for those answers. Linda, I know you have several questions come on the, you know, how do you manage this and make all this happen? Um, and Terry, you spoke a bit to your team, but Linda, you wanna go ahead and ask yeah, thanks, Janie. I do have a cascading set of questions, Terry, but you did start <laughs> right into the first one, so you're a good, good straight man. Yeah, I, you know, I was asking, I mean, this is very impressive, and this is exactly what I, as the community champion, hope we can do in Nashville, which is to get best of breed and integrate it and then give citizens the way to get engaged. And so right. it, it, it sounds like um, you were just saying, my question was, were you able with your own team and with your partner vendors to design, develop, integrate, and then manage the ongoing use of the system? It, it just it seems like if you, and, and, and really more, it sounds like they report to you. So is are you leading smart cities for Kerry? So you're outside of IT, you're outside of a particular department and you're an umbrella organization. Is that how that works? So um, I'm, I'm, uh... I'm in IT. I'm the smart. I'm the town smart city strategist. Um, and I will say, from a management standpoint, when you think about it, you know we're we're already managing Salesforce for CRM, and so you know smart this these sensors and everything are a part of that management. So they're already managing that. So you know that's an easy addition. Um, We've got our Azure environment. We have we have Office 365, and the Azure uh, the the IoT piece is just a component of our Azure environment. So we're already managing that. You know, Esri, we we talked a lot about that. SaaS, we use SaaS for town analytics, so it's just a piece of that. Um, and and another important piece is Billy is the stormwater subject matter expert on our smart and connected community committee. We have a townwide committee, all the departments are represented, and we have two members from every department on that committee. And so we it took us three hard years of <laughs> selling this design and talking about this and the culture. Billy mentioned, you know, we got a new town manager. Culture building. Um, and I will say that as Stormwater being the foundational component. It's like when you, uh, staff will know what they want when you build it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we worked with Billy creating all of this. And now Billy is our biggest advocate for implementing. And I say that because a co culture is a big component of this because, you know, you, you'll have departments that want to go out and buy siloed solutions. And they're like, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to have to go through this and, and build this, but I'm like, take that effort that you're going to do going out and do it, going and getting these solutions and, and folk refocus it in building this ecosystem. Just get, you know, get the sensors or get the, the platform you already have and let's tie it into this. And once you get one or two wins with the departments, like it is just a snowball. You know, we, we've got our admins wanting to put parking sensors in. Well, that was um, my next question. Transportation. <laughs> have you already done that? Have you already done, yeah, mobile yeah, payment? To add, to add to what Terry said, you know, we have five different sets of rain gauges and, and on different platforms. And now, and and different people at the town have, have those. So, and now we're pulling it all together. We have one one place where we store all the ring ages data and not in five. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, we're working on our, so our traffic management system, uh, an important piece around that is uh, uh, either Microsoft or uh, Dell Boomi can be uh, the, uh, so what I, I got, I got a great story on that. 
our traffic folks wanted to go uh, with to a, an outside third-party vendor to pull data and do analytics and all that. And they wanted to put a VPN concentrator in our traffic management network. And we were like, hey, let's not do that. I said, we're fine with you sending the data out of that third-party vendor, but let's establish a connection into this ecosystem. We'll create an open API right. because the traffic management system doesn't have it. We'll use our, our core platforms, create an open API from there. We'll send the data out to this third party and they can do analytics all day long. But we're going to ingest it in this and we're going to create, you know, automated work orders and we're going to create the visualization in Esri. And so, you know, it, it's a it's a partnership and you have to mm -hmm. kind of break it down in that that sense with them. No, so, that's and right. It, and redundant, that. Redundancy is also redundancy is definitely a benefit of that. Right. Now, this is fabulous. And in my last question, you answered how long it took you to get there. It was several years and then launching it. Do you have metrics where you evaluate the value and the savings against the cost and expenses so that, you know, people realize the valuability your team's getting and then these other teams are getting, having the data, having, you know, adaptive, responsive technology? How, how do you justify in other words when you're asked to talk about return on the investment yeah um at this point we're, we're still in the beginning in terms of the capital cost so the capital costs have not been that great and I, i'm sure down the road we'll we'll be able to uh you know ascertain that but at this point um i don't know that we have anything you may want to speak to that, Terry. Do you know? Yeah. yeah so, um, so it, in Carrie, we have uh, so there's several ways that we, from a funding standpoint, I'll talk about the metrics here in a second. Uh, from a funding standpoint, we have an allocation in the budget in the IT in IT's budget uh, for smart and connected community components. Okay. Um, we our smart and connected committee every budget year. Uh, puts requests in on things that they want to do. Uh, an example, uh, we brought in these greenway counters into our uh, ecosystem, and we've we've sh those eco counters uh, have been in three different departments and under various deployments. Well, now they're all wanting to be a part of this. They've come to us and say, "Hey, can you guys absorb all of these into the smart cities effort?" Uh, it, which goes into kind of our enterprise budget. Because uh, and now so now we're doing the budget request and we're doing the maintenance and the management of them because they want to be part of this you know effort. Uh, so so we've got that where we've got this allocation of funding there and then we also have uh, at, you know and like Billy was mentioning our stormwater efforts. So our individual efforts have money in them. And so what we've learned in this deployment is that. When you already have the platforms built, it's a very little cost, a very little smart city cost to bolt on the smart city components. So if I've already got um, if I've already got the stormwater effort, I mean Billy's got money and he's buying the sensors. So he's got money in his budget to buy the sensors. Uh, all we're doing is doing a little expansion here on on Azure. We're doing a little expansion, not I mean, we've already got all the licensing for Esri and all that, so it's it's really staff time. It's just your staff time from a from that standpoint. So it doesn't take a lot of justification when you're using the big platforms you already you know you've already uh, got established. Uh, so we just pull we pull a little money out of that smart city funding for the platform costs, and then we use the projects to get the devices and the other the other components. And a perfect example is a platform. If you have a transportation network, what we care about is the API. Right. You know, we care about that API to pull the data out. So maybe we have to buy some API, some licenses in uh, Microsoft or licenses in Boomi to connect to that API to pull the data out. So, great. So, Thank that, you. And congratulations. Answer? That's fabulous. Yeah, cool. appreciate it. Just amazing. Um, thanks for a good question, Linda. I think that was useful and information for our broader group here and others on the webinar. 
And Terry, can you speak at all to the, you know, the upfront capital costs for the smart and connected community, like the initial effort and the two day workshop, you know, can you put a dollar amount to what it took to really just kind of jumpstart this and get it going? Um, uh, so, so, so with our workshop, we were very fortunate in having partners that helped, that donated some their time, uh, their time and licensing and components like that. So that to get this, to get the workshop done and get all that going, uh, we had uh, those some of those components provided by vendors. Uh, other components we already had, like a you know, as I mentioned, we already we already use Esri, we already use SaaS, we already use Salesforce. Um, uh, and what we did was any any additional funding, we have about uh, $400,000 allocated in our budget for smart and connected community uh, projects. Um, we did not use, I mean, I, I would say to build these components, we probably use less than $100,000 uh, currently. Now, now, obviously, I do want to make a point that when you start bringing your data into a centralized place, you know, you're going to, the more connections you make and the more data you bring in, obviously, that that number is going to grow. Uh, but we had to start somewhere. And so, you know, we've, we've um, currently, I'll, I'll give you an example, our Azure spend for this particular piece, uh, we're running about $3,000 a month uh, for these particular uh, 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 water level sensors and rain gauges, the eco counters, uh, the parking deck uh, data. We use cameras in our parking decks and we're actually pulling in the uh, usage data. We have analytics built in the cameras. Uh, we use Meraki, Cisco Meraki cameras uh, that are installed in our parking decks and we're pulling the data from those Meraki cameras in. And so um, as we add, we, we, re we are requesting about three times uh, the amount of cost per month uh, for next year's budget, because we know we're going to bring this data in. So um, yeah, I know that's not a, <laughs> it's not like, hey, here's one sum, uh, because it, I, I just stress enough, we've already got these big components and we're utilizing them and, and it's not really costing us um, that much more. I, I had to buy some Dell Boomi data connectors uh, that run me about uh, twenty, thirty thousand uh, for the year, additional. So, um, you know, it, it's just kind of been a fluid process. So, all right. Um, I think in the interest of time, we're going to have to wrap up in a few minutes. Um, we did have another question um, about whether or not you all are integrating smart stormwater infrastructure on private property. I think that's for Billy. Um, um, yeah, go ahead. Officially, we do not, but uh, you know, where we're putting our sensors, we're we're doing right of entries. Uh, we do do th additional things for uh, private property, uh, but for the most part, you know, we stay in the right of way and on town property. Right. We we did do. Uh, we did get Billy was instrumental in getting uh, uh, the encroachment agreements with the uh, DOT. Our culverts, uh, our, our, the culverts going to our roads are, are owned by DOT, and so we had to get that right of way agreement. Um, I think another thing that's unique is that we uh, were able to work with the GreenStream and come up with uh, these sleeves that go over the culverts, so you're not bolting into the culvert. Uh, you're really, it's a sleeve that goes on top of the culvert or down in the middle if you have like, you know, a split, uh, a split culvert. Uh, these sleeves that hold the, the mast arms for the sensors and, uh, you know, Billy had a lot of uh, input into that and that, that, that's made it a very non-intrusive install. But, you know, walking the type of public versus private is, you know, we, we try to Error towards the helping the private side as much as we can, knowing that that we have public funds that need to be used for public purpose. Okay, all right, thanks, guys. Um, I also want to, I want to thank both of you for your time and Michael for his, and hopefully all of you are 
willing and open for folks from Nashville and other places to reach out with additional questions. Absolutely. Um, and I'll turn it over. Awesome. Great. Thank first. you. I have <laughs> Um, yeah, before December 31st, Terry's meeting. <laughs> um, thanks to all of you. This has been amazing. You're all doing such great work that's inspiring for those of us here in Nashville. Um, and I'll let Philip close this out. Thanks, Janie. Really appreciate that. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Billy. Thank you, Terry. Terry, best of luck and do some fishing in Cabo when you get there. Um, <laughs> I, I really like the money slide, and I, I appreciate you doing that. And just for everybody who's still on, next week it's going to be a deep dive into sensors. You heard about High Five from Michael. You heard about uh, Green Stream from Billy and Terry. And you also hear about IntelliSense, which is uh, a set of sensors that uh, DHS has been piloting. So thank you, everybody, for your time, and have a great and safe day. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you.